Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. We're going to be uh, looking at some of the issues in the little book of James, way back at the end of the New Testament. Take your Bible, turn to James 1, and let's begin by reading uh, verse 12 and on. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Hmm. Sounds like there's something to avoid here. <laughs> yeah, it does. And it's pretty scary because it sounds like most of our sins come from where? Inside us. Inside us. Wow. I mean, we can't blame him on somebody else. Can't blame him, on, not even on the devil. I'm, I'm reminded of the story of a, a lady who belonged to a church, and she had developed the habit of never saying anything bad about anybody. So someone thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trap her. I'm going to, you know. He says, okay, tell me what you think about the devil. And she thought for a moment or two, she said, he certainly is a persistent fellow. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but who is this James? We need, we need to take a moment or two and talk about who this James is. There are several people in the New... Well, first of all, we need to recognize an interesting fact. <coughs> when the Bible translators were translating the New Testament, they decided there were too many Jacobs in the Bible, so they changed all the Jacobs in the New Testament to James. And I'm presuming they did this because this book was commissioned by the King James. But that, in fact, there were no people in the Bible by the name of James. So when you read James here, it really should be Jacob. And if you go to a different, some other language, it's not English, you go to Spanish and so forth, it'll be Jacobo, something like that. So it wasn't really James. But saying that aside, who was he? Well, there are several possible Jameses that, that are mentioned in the Bible. James, the brother of John, the famous James and John pair, he was beheaded in AD 44 by um, King Herod and therefore almost certainly could not have written this book because there was no, there was no writing going on that early among, among Christians. So it wasn't that James. We know about other Jameses. There was uh, uh, some who were, well, there's some others who are relatively minor players in the whole scene. But the James who wrote this book describes himself and in, in um, verse 1, from James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, greetings to all God's people scattered over the whole world. And if you, well, I, maybe I'll wait and do that later. Um, it's interesting if you have more... You've got the King James there, I think, don't you? New King James. The New King James. Could you read the first couple of verses there? James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, who the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Okay, let's stop right there. It worried a lot of the early church believers in the first two, three centuries after Jesus that this book was written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Who would that include? 
Well, they're Jews. Only Jews. And if you look at the history of James in Scripture, what was his attitude toward Jesus in the early days? If he, James it, are you talking about? If he was indeed the stepbrother, the older stepbrother of Jesus, mm -hmm. he despised him early on. Yes. And he tried to give him advice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how did he come to be associated with Christians? That yes. advice that he tried to give him was the advice about going into the festival. Go to, the, go to Jerusalem. A, get down there. If you, somewhat if you of think, a mocking way. Yeah. If you, if, you're, if you pretend to be the Messiah, get down to Jerusalem. Make yourself known. Take charge of the country here. You know, let's see you be a king. I'm serious. That's John 7. Um, forgotten the exact verses, but it's there in John 7. Um, but it turns out that in Acts, the first chapter, suddenly the mother of Jesus and his brothers joined the disciples. Why did they do that? Get in on the action. Get in on the action. Because they were, were convinced based on the doing. evidence presented to them that Jesus was God. They finally, apparently, were convinced by whatever evidence. By, was it by his resurrection? Possibly. By some kind of evidence, they, they became convinced that Jesus, the guy that they had been sort of giving him a bad time all his life, was in fact the, the, the promised Messiah. But this James had a really hard time giving up his Jewish prejudices. And it was, he, was, he was the leader of the group that, in Acts 15, served as a kind of first general conference committee. Now, now why would he have a hard time giving up his Jewish prejudices when he was Jewish? Well, I mean, that was That's the point. The reason. <laughs> he, he, he had a very... Oh, he had a very hard time now thinking... prejudices against... No, in favor of Jews. Okay? He very much... Um, and if you look at the small little book called Sketches from the Life of Paul by Ellen White, he was largely responsible with two or three of his friends for the demise of, of Paul, Paul, for his imprisonment and so forth. Um, he, they, James and his, some of his other fellow disciples... Or, uh, disciples who were associated with him, they felt that despite all of Paul's work, despite, despite the huge offerings he brought in, everything else like this, that Paul was responsible for the huge prejudice that existed between Jews and Gentiles. So uh, that's pretty scary, but that's enough said about this gentleman who, who decided he's going to write to the Jewish people. Um, in, in, in favor of Christianity. And what does he talk about? Well, very briefly, if you were to say it in a few words, James says, when you get together with a community and you live together for a little while, there's going to be some differences of opinion. And well, how do we deal with those things? And he's pretty blunt about things like how you use your tongue, um, how you regard others in, among the group, uh, those who are richer than you are, those who are poorer than you are, and so forth. And so let's jump into that and, and look, at, uh, look at some of the things. Uh, look at verse 19 and following of James 1. Remember this, my dear friends, everyone must be quick to listen, but slow to speak and slow to become angry. Does that sound like a nice, uh, 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 respectful pastor talking to his church? Human anger does not achieve God's righteous purpose. So get rid of every filthy habit and all wicked conduct. Submit to God and accept the word that he plants in your hearts, which is able to save you. Do not deceive yourselves by just listening to his word. Instead, put it into practice. So he's beginning to, he's beginning to develop his theme here. And the theme of James, of course, is that your righteousness, however good it might be, is pretty much worthless unless it's put into practice. Why is James deciding to take this topic on? Why is well, he going to... Is this just one, is this one out of a series of, you know, uh, uh, 25 or 30 sermons, and this is the only one that we've got left? Or is he, James, is he feeling like he needs to tell these people not to be 
getting angry. James feels like he's got a right like this because he's a church administrator. <clears throat> he's not the guy that's out there on the front lines converting new, new converts. This guy is a, is a conference leader and he says, you people stop, stop squabbling. Get your so, act together. So in other words, um, uh, it's not just a topic, uh, no. a general topic. There's a problem here. Yes. That he's, uh, my goodness, they're just, I mean, Jesus is just gone. Mm -hmm. That kind of still happens today, doesn't it, mm. within the church? Some squabbling mm -hmm. and fighting about this and that. Mm. Well, he goes on to say in verse 25, but if you look closely into the perfect law that sets people free, what law is that? Oh, the law of liberty. Yeah. Well, that's a perfect law. Uh, give me the contents of the law of liberty. Well, that's, that's what my question. Which law is it? And then I'll tell you what the contents are. <laughs> well, somebody said the law of liberty, and that's it here, so. Yeah. Is there any such thing as a law that sets people free, that makes people? Sure. I mean, we usually think of laws as restricting our freedoms, don't we? Well, if, if James is uh, hanging on to his Jewish prejudices, then he, wouldn't he be talking about the five books of Moses and, mm -hmm. and the Old Testament and, and all of that? Mm -hmm. Probably. And so what, if James were looking back, as, as a good, faithful Jew, he's looking back at the Old Testament, what would he be rethinking about when he calls it the perfect law of liberty? Now, is this, is this, <clears throat> is this before uh, the time, is he writing this before the time he's taking after Paul, or is this after the time he's taken after before. Paul? Before. Oh, my goodness. Doesn't that mean this book's a little corrupt? <laughs> Well, I mean, if James is, is, well, maybe you better define what he did to Paul first. He, he, he basically, instead of defending Paul, he said, you have to, in order to prove that you're a real Jew, you've got to take on this vow and you've got to go with these guys and you've got to go into the temple and so forth. And the result was that Paul was arrested and put in prison for most of the rest of his life. So now, <laughs> James is writing this under that kind of a, uh, of a of an understanding? So wouldn't that kind of taint this book? Well, what, no what, wonder Martin Luther wanted to put it here at the back. What <laughs> okay, what kind of people was James dealing with <clears throat> among the Christians in Jerusalem? A bunch of, bunch of Gentiles who were hard wandered hard. into the church and we... No. They what? were hard-hearted, prejudiced. Okay. Where, do, where would you get the evidence for that? Look at Acts 15, because this is a place where he acts as a general conference president. Look at Acts 15, verse 5. But some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees. That would be there Paul, were, right? There would be plenty of Pharisees in the Christian church. And James is having to deal with them. Well, but Paul's, Paul's group, he was a Pharisee. He yeah, but been. Paul was the he problem. He wasn't like that, right? But Paul, Paul was the problem. Paul was the guy who, who left the, the ultimate conservative Pharisee group and went all the way to the other side. Maybe Jim didn't truly believe his conversion. <laughs> but, this, but the verse you picked out kind of, I don't want to say contradicts something here, but it says... Um, then some of the believers who belong, reading from verse 5, yeah. 15, 5, yeah. then some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees, such as Paul, yeah. stood so up and the said... Such as Paul is not in the... Is but, not. but, no, such as Paul as one of the Pharisees, but yeah. Paul was actually the opposite of this, mm -hmm. stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised exactly. and required to obey the law of Moses, which Paul was against that. Yes. So is that the law of liberty that he's talking about? That's what I was thinking about earlier, which we might term the new covenant. Yeah, which, which, which part of? Which, which, okay. which side well, is we, James taking? We, we could have a lot of discussion about this, but I, the only reason I mentioned <laughs> that particular verse is we need to understand what James was dealing with. A whole bunch of Pharisees had decided to become Christians, but they were still Pharisees. Well, but it sounds like from our discussion that Paul... 
that James seemed to have an inclination along that way, too. <clears throat> oh, really? You think so? So, <laughs> how... He did. How, how can he be uh, critical of them? Well, he'd be he, trying to 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 uh, abrade them here for their improper uh, uh, approach to uh, understanding here when he subscribes that, that's to it why, himself. That's why a lot of people have trouble with the Book of James. I guess we all need Jesus. Yes, everyone. Yes. Well, the perfect law of liberty—the only thing that can possibly qualify there—is the Ten Commandments. And why would it be called a, a law of liberty? It's called a law of liberty because those Ten Commandments describe the way things really work. They're not proscriptive laws, they're descriptive laws. They describe the way things really work. When and you, if you realize... When, when you base your life on those, on those principles, then you find that... Uh, as it says in Galatians 5... You are liberated. It, yeah. If you, as it, it says in Galatians 5, to start, we're starting with verse 19, if you, if you obey this kind of a law, you're never going to be in trouble with the government. You're never going to be in trouble with anybody. Everybody's going to be happy with what you're doing. Oh, I don't know about that. They might maybe be happy you're not stealing, maybe happy yeah, you're not sure. lying, but the minute you start going to church on Saturday, you're going to have problems. Well, yeah... <laughs> that's that's yeah if you if you want to go to that that point yeah so going on to chapter 2 well look at the end of chapter 1 do any of think any of you think you're religious maybe this is addressed to his pharisee friends if you do not control your tongue your religion is worthless and you deceive yourself is that blunt or what what God the Father considers to be pure and genuine religion is this, to take care of orphans and widows in their suffering and to keep oneself from being corrupted by the world. Where did he get that? Well, Jesus said it. It's throughout the Old Testament. It's find it in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. and as a matter of fact, it seems like that's the only thing Christians are ever really told to do. Mm-hmm. Even in the Old Testament, you find that the God would come down and he was upset with somebody, and those were always the things that he brought up as pick on widows, pick on orphans, take care of these people, mm -hmm. uh, the poor people. I was always after them. And he came, it just seems to me like a good share of the time when he was laying out the law to these people, it was because, <clears throat> which is a puzzle to me, because I don't find the particular denomination of which I'm a member, uh, heavy into orphanages or, or any of this other kind Ezekiel of Ezekiel 16, mm -hmm. 40. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom, and her daughters had pride, surfeit of food, prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and the needy. And it repeats Yeah, well, there's that. lots of but places there. where it says Isaiah says that, Amos says that, Micah says that, Hosea says that. Yeah, lots of places in the Old Testament. Just for the record, back up a notch. In uh, Great Controversy, page uh, 466, uh, the Apostle James, who wrote after the death of Christ, refers to the Decalogue as the royal law and the perfect law of liberty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I agree with that. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When Jesus served, Paul talks about his commandments. Is he talking about the Ten Commandments, or could it be um, a more distilled well, a commandment that he talked about, you know, during his life? Well, this, in answer to that, I'm, I'm going to answer something not directly. I'm going to answer your question sort of indirectly. Some scholars who have studied a lot the book of James have said the book of James is like a, a, a mini commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. It's an expansion, an addition to the Sermon on the Mount. Think about that. So you can go through the Sermon of the Mount and then you find all these in as your... Much of the same information is right over there. Spoken in different words, but yes. Gary? Okay. okay. 
So going on to chapter 2, my friends, as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, you must never treat people in different ways according to their outward appearance. Okay? So now we're talking about another aspect of religion. Suppose a rich man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes comes to your meeting, and a poor man in ragged clothes also comes. If you show more respect to the well-dressed man and say to him, have this best seat here, but say to the poor man, ah, stand over there, or sit here on the floor at my feet, then you are guilty of creating distinctions among yourselves and of making judgments based on evil motives. How do you suppose the Pharisees who became believers behaved when they came to church? They may have still wanted the premium spots, the places of honor. They probably still wore their same clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Your fine clothes and gold <laughs> ring, are you saying? <laughs> yeah. What, what? I mean, weren't they converted? Why in the world did they join this, this persecuted well, yeah. passel of, of people if, if they weren't, I mean, are they just, well, uh, it, they, they studied the scriptures and it was just a, uh, a, a, an academic thing to them? Oh, yep, well, he fits and it all fits, so that's the way it is, so we better... Mm -hmm. Better go, or what? Weren't they, weren't they converted by the message that he brought? Mm -hmm. It reminds me of John the Baptist. Do you remember what he said when some Pharisees and Sadducees came to him? Look at uh, Matthew chapter three, starting with verse seven. When John saw, John saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to him to be baptized, right. there's your question, right? He said to them, "You snakes." <laughs> so, you what do you really think? Is, is that what James is saying here, only a little more politely, you snakes? I, I think so. <laughs> who, who told you that you could escape from the punishment? God is about to sin. Do those things that will show that you have turned from your sins, okay? Do the things that will show that you've turned from your sins. And don't think that you can escape punishment by saying that Abraham is your ancestor. I tell you that God can take these rocks and make descendants of Abraham and so forth. Well, if James is wanting to calm a lot of dissension <laughs> and, and, and arguing and stuff, I, I don't think a veiled snake's routine is going to do a very good job at that. <laughs> well, if you, if you see people who are causing a lot of trouble in church, do you need to speak forthrightly to them? They came out there with very ulterior motives. Mm -hmm. Ellen White says that they came out there basically as a show. It was, a, it was not something that was sincere in their hearts at all. And uh, John saw right through it and went mm -hmm. straight to the point. Do you are think are you saying that the Pharisees in James's time that James is writing about in chapter mm -hmm. 2 are the same as the Pharisees in uh, John the Baptist? Considering what they said in John 15, verse 5, yes. John 15, 5 or Acts 15? 5? I'm sorry, Acts 15, 5. They said, Paul, you can go out there and win all those Gentiles that you want, but they have got to become fully Jews, they have to be circumcised, they have to do all the things that we Jews do, otherwise we are not going to accept them. That is basically what they said. Okay? we got to be in the same building as them. They've got to act like us. Right, especially if they're going <laughs> to sit down in church with us. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Well, he goes on. Verse 8 of chapter 2, you'll be doing the right thing if you obey the law of the kingdom. Would that be the perfect law of liberty? Which is found in the scripture, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, you know, if they still have these kinds of attitudes, then... They should have been thrown out of the church, right? No, I'm trying to figure out that. I mean, that would seem to indicate that... I mean, it, it would be, it seems like it would be easy to argue that Jesus didn't do a very good job of, of what was Jesus, what kind of message was Jesus, uh, how are these people coming into this, it well, just looks like Jesus didn't do a very good job of why? spreading the message. Just well, now. here we are today, 2,000 years later, we've got the whole Bible and we have 500 different denominations or more of Christianity. Well, that's another. That would be another argument. It's Je <laughs> Jesus did a Jesus did a wonderful job. I think the problem lies in humans, the 
yeah. mankind. Yeah, but didn't he come down here to fix us? <laughs> well, he on his terms. Save us. Yeah. With grace. Well, but it, it, well, is, it is good, for whatever reason, it's good to note what's going on here and to see it, it's, although it's puzzling. It's, in a way, it's a little comforting yes. when we experience all that now, but we, we certainly seem to expect, and it sounds like James is kind of saying, you, could, you should be expecting something different here, mm -hmm. and yet it's like we're saying, well, but it's just the way we are. What do you think about his next words in, in James 2, verse 10? Whoever breaks one commandment is guilty of breaking them all. And I guess I should read the next couple of verses for the same one who said, do not commit adultery. Where is that found? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Commandment. One of the Ten Commandments. Also said, do not commit murder. That's a ten, one of the Ten Commandments. Even if you do not commit adultery, you have become a lawbreaker if you commit murder. Speak and act as people who will be judged by the law that sets us free. So there he spells out which the law it is that sets us free, right? Yes. And Jesus himself said, even if you think it, you have done it. Mm -hmm. Isn't this so we need Christ. New King James says, law of liberty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then he goes on. But why did, I mean, you asked about the one and getting them all. Mm -hmm. Guilty of all. Okay. The issue is the, the common denominator is rebellion. Mm -hmm. And rebellion is rebellion. If you rebel against one, you're still a rebel. Well, yeah, and let me, let me apply your, your principle there. If you were responsible for, an, or if you were the proverbial St. Peter at the gate of heaven, letting people in or keeping them out, uh, which one of the ten? Well, which one of the ten commandments would you be happy to say? Oh, you can break that one. It's fine. Come on in. Mm -mm. No, because it's rebellion. <laughs> I can't let rebellion in. I mean, would you like be happy to let in murderers, thieves, it seems adulterers? Like whenever they bring but up repentant, repentant. Yeah, but it seems like whenever they bring up this stuff, you know, like. If you break one law, you break them all. It's always talking about somewhere in there is somebody that might be puffed up that he's keeping the law, you know, yeah. and that's Pharisees, you know. Mm -hmm. They would probably think that, so he's probably up to his armpits and Pharisees right now. <laughs> that's what he's talking about. Well, my friends, what good is it for one of you to say if you have faith, in, in, if your actions do not prove it, can, it that, can that faith save you? Verse 14, then going on to verse 15 of chapter 2, suppose there are brothers or sisters who need clothes and don't have enough to eat. What good is there in your saying to them? Now, the Pharisees, let, let's, let's talk about the Pharisees for a moment. These are people who are relatively rich. Rich. You almost had to be rich to be a Pharisee because it was almost a full-time job just to practice your religion. So you had to be independently wealthy to just be a Pharisee. And now they've joined the Christian church because they think they, they could just see from hard, cold evidence that it looks like these people have got it together better than the people we've been with, so we're going to join them. But we want them to be like us, okay? So who do you think Paul, uh, J uh, James is speaking to? He says, what good is there in your saying to them, God bless you, keep warm and eat well, if you don't give them the necessities of life? So it is with faith. If it is all alone and includes no actions, then it is dead. And here we are with James's argument that people have had a problem with compared to Paul's faith. Which is it, folks? Stand, stand by.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. Are there any Pharisees in your church? <laughs> Don't I all look at me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about the question. Pharisees, but we got a Sabbath school that calls themselves the Sadducees. <laughs> <laughs> I think we could all be called Pharisees at some time or another when we're so sure we're right on something. Uh, speak and for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and whether we so are so right or not, there. it's an <laughs> attitude of our rightness. Yes. Well, someone will say one person has faith and another one has actions. Excuse me. My answer is, show me anyone who can have faith without actions. I will show you my faith by my actions. How would you respond to that? Well, that's a good definition of faith there. Okay. I mean, you could, mm -hmm. some people say that faith is just merely a synonym for belief. But he sounds like he's saying that uh, faith is a combination of belief and actions. Well, so it's a bundle. Yeah. So the next verse gives us some clues. In chapter 2, verse... James 2, verse 19. Do you believe that there's only one God? Good. The demons also believe and tremble with fear. They know that God exists. There's no question in their mind of whether God exists. And how does it affect them? They shudder. They shudder. But see, the actions are different, though. I yeah. mean, the belief is the same, but the actions are different. Very different. So... You fool, he goes on, do you want to be shown that faith without actions is useless? How was our ancestor Abraham put right with God? It was through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. And no Jew can really offer, argue with that one. Um, can't you see his faith and his actions work together? His faith was made perfect through his actions. And the scripture came true that said, Abraham believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. And so Abraham was called God's friend. Now, how could you do better than that? Sounds like he, Abraham is getting righteous by his works. Oh, really? By his faith. Better well, read I don't and, know. and the action of doing. Better read verse 24. Verse 24. You see then that it is by our actions that we are put right with God and not by our faith alone. Oh, I'll, oh I'll, dear. The word is alone there, there is good. Give, give me, help me with the Greek. Because every time <laughs> mine says works, yours says actions. Why? Because that the word can mean, well, the word traditionally means works, but it literally means doing something. And so my Good News Bible feels like actions is a better, is a better translation. So why, why is I like yours. You said doing something yeah. just now. What is, what, is, what is James telling these people? Is that they just, I think they, they've got all kinds of faith, but, no, but they, aren't, they uh, really don't have faith because they don't have works? Or I think James is dealing with a lot of people, including a lot of former Pharisees who were still Pharisees, really, but they claim to be Christians in the church at Jerusalem, and he said, look, you people, you've got to get your act together and start acting like Christians and not just in name only. That Amen. has been their problem throughout history, yes. in that they claim to be children of Abraham and believe in all the good things that he has, and yet they were a bunch of vipers stealing from the widows and mm -hmm. all kinds of things that were anti-anything Abraham stood for. Well, you know, it sounds to me like there's a lot of talk going on, but not enough action. Yeah. That's James 2, 16 and 17, basically yeah. that. What good is there in you saying to them, God bless you, keep warm and eat well to the homeless and the out in the yeah. cold and rain, if you don't give them the necessities of life? So it is with faith, so if it is, is alone, faith. If it is alone and includes no actions, then it is dead. So, okay. so faith and actions. In light of these verses, is, is, is James in contradiction to Paul? But it, you know, and when we talk about faith and works today, mm -hmm. um, it se seems to me like it's, it's a little different than James's approach here. That it seems to me that, you know, <clears throat> if you have faith today, you've got enough, then your works will follow your faith. Mm -hmm. Whereas it seems here that James is almost saying 
that you need to deliberately start working on your works, and, uh, which, and which seems to be a, 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 a juxtaposition or an, or an opposite of what seems to me to me a, a, a contemporary theology today about about. And faith. those works seem to be <coughs> love, mercy, and grace, helping others, being kind. Kind of a yeah, different different definition of what though. we would be considered. It's not you know, just works. talking about it. It's actually, you Doing know, it. coughing up, reaching into your pocket and pulling out whatever change you got. And, get, and, and another way I've, you know. I've thought about it sometimes, and it bothers me a little bit, I've <laughs> <coughs> I wondered Is it your if conscience bothering you? <laughs> my work's bothering me. If, <laughs> if, if one's works are a litmus of one's faith, mm -hmm. you know, if, you're, if you look at your works and you're not doing a whole lot, at least what you think you ought to do, or, or whatever, it, you know, is that saying something about your faith? And I'm, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that because I look at my works a lot, and they don't. Well, I don't look at them enough, but well, I worry about them. Well, when when you they complain about, you know, when you break one law, and you you break them all, you're you're kind of talking about people who rely on works, mm -hmm. if you know, and that's that's a bad thing too, but. Um, He's talking about people who rely on faith too much that never pro produce any works. So, you know, if, we're kind of bouncing back and forth here. If, if you perceive that your, your life really needs to be strengthened spiritually, can you in part do that by, by getting to work? Can you, well, can you, can you... Let's, let's no, take... Is there kind you, of a, a circular thing here? If you work, you strengthen your faith and your faith produces more works. If you go at it from trying to gin up more work, you're going to be in deep trouble and a total failure. If, though, you have come to, to see Christ and see what he suffered and what he did for you, and you say, I, Lord, I've got nothing, but you can make me something like you, it's liable to happen that you start doing something you didn't do before. But you have to get the motive, you have to get the power, you have to get everything for about those works from Christ. You can't just start working on works. It, it'll, it's a failure every time. Did, did Paul believe in works, if you want to call them works or actions? No, he believed in this kind of faith that works. Okay. Uh, look at a couple of verses in Paul's <laughs> premier document, the book of Romans. Romans 1 verse 5, my version says, Through him God gave me the privilege of being an apostle for the sake of Christ in order to lead people of all nations to believe, to have faith, and obey. More than that, in chapter 2 verse 13, 12 and 13, he says, The Gentiles do not have the law of Moses. They sin and are lost apart from the law. The Jews have the law. They sin and are judged by the law. For it is not by hearing the law that people are put right with God, but by doing what the law demands. How about that? Shouldn't that wow. mean that verse somehow migrated over there from the book of James? Wow. Well, uh, that's true. I mean, why wouldn't that be true? It but is. That's in Paul's book that talks about faith. Well, it's still true. <laughs> it's still <laughs> it's true. It's a balance. It's a balance. It, the think... problem is that the, there is a great big tendency on the part of humanity to want to say, I have faith, right. but not get involved yeah, don't, don't with the rest do, of it. Don't, don't make me do too much. That's exactly right. And, oh. and, and a real big tendency, not only by, by Christians, many Christians, but by pagans, this is the real thing, is to think when you do things, you're getting on the good side of God. You're earning when you salary. are doing things, you're, you're working your way into, you can walk up to the pearly gates and you can say, I've done this and this and this, stand back, St. Peter, I'm entitled to be there. Right, and it turns out that the Pharisees, you can document that, it's in our, in our handout. The Pharisees taught that when you do a good work, you're, 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 you're adding to the goods. You've got a balance of goods over here. And when you do evil, you balance of And so your salvation sort of depends on how the good works balance with the bad works. That was the way they did it. So as long as you got 
five pounds of good works and five pounds of bad works here. Well, you need to have a little less bad works. That's oh, four good, pounds of bad. That's good Catholic theology. Yes. Yeah, but you know, if you did really love the law, if you really love the law, and you you love it because you have faith in it, because you think it's the right thing to do. Aren't you sometime going to start doing the right works just because of, of, of your love for it? I oh, mean, no. if you truly love it, yeah. you're going you're gonna to start doing it sometime. Okay. Well, let's go back to the book of James and let's look at some of the other challenges here. We've talked about the wonderful example of faith in the great father of the faithful, Abraham. Well, look what he mentions next. Chapter 2, verse 25, it was the same with the prostitute Rahab. Why in the world is he mentioning her? She was put right with God through her actions by welcoming the Israelite spies and helping them to escape by a different road. So then, as the body without the spirit is dead, also faith without actions is dead. Why would you pick out Rahab as a great example of faith? Well, how many, else, how many other people in that city would actually do what she did and actually believed that um, what's going to be happening in the next few days. Mm -hmm. yeah. she, risked her, she risked her life. Yeah, she risked her life to accomplish what she did. But, but why was she so confident in doing that? She had just seen what had gone on. She had, she had heard the stories and, and now here they were casing the place and she just felt that these people were in contact with the bigger power. She, she had, was the only one. She and had, it gives us a wide range also. We go from Abraham to the Rahab the prostitute. Yeah. In other words, there's, God has a large tent. There's plenty of room for everyone. In and, it. and God traditionally leads his church, takes his church leaders and, and, and sends them directly to the house of the prostitute. And he made her a part of the lineage of Jesus. Yes, she becomes one of the ancestors of Jesus. Boaz's mother. Boy, this is, this is a problem, isn't it? No. She had, she the thief had, on the cross is just as big a problem. Okay. She had plenty of Same evidence. Same issue. Mm -hmm. She had all kinds of customers who had lots of stories to tell. Mm -hmm. And I think she had a whole lot more, <laughs> a whole lot more evidence <laughs> than everybody else in there. Is that where she got her evidence from? Well, customers? I don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's hey, what just. What do you know uh, about those kind of customers? <laughs> <laughs> Not anything. <laughs> okay. Good answer. <laughs> Not anything. <laughs> that's why. That's why I seem to drift a little bit. <laughs> I was going to say uh, not much, thing. but I figure that's not. <laughs> no. I don't know anything about those kinds of customers. Okay. I'm just. My friends, he goes on. <laughs> not many of you should become teachers. Jay, you're a teacher. As you know, we teachers will be judged with greater strictness than others. All of us often make mistakes, but if a person never makes a mistake in what he says, he is perfect and is also able to control his whole being. We put a bit into the mouth of a horse to make it obey us, and we are able to make it go where we want. Or think of a ship, big as it is and driven by such strong winds, it can be steered by a very small rudder, and it goes wherever the pilot wants it to go. So it is with the tongue, small as it is, it can boast about great things. And he goes on to talk about forest fires. The tongue is like a fire. And I mean, whoa, what's he trying to say here? Be careful what you say. <laughs> be, be careful what be you careful do. Yeah. And he, are you on? I, was just, I just read up to verse 5 of chapter 3. It's usually that your words reflect what you actually are thinking. Yes. In your heart. Yeah. And what your thoughts are. Yes. Well, he says, words of thanksgiving, verse 10, chapter 3, words of thanksgiving and cursing pour out from the same mouth. My friends, this should not happen. No spring of water pours out sweet water and bitter water from the same opening. A fig tree, my friends, cannot bear olives. A grapevine cannot bear frigs. Nor can, figs, nor can a salty spring produce sweet water. So does that mean I can't say anything bad about the Democrats? <laughs> I don't know. It'd be nice all the time, but I can't say anything about, can't be upset Boy. with the Democrats or? Well, you might say they're pretty persistent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I'm not so sure we're interpreting that right. <laughs> okay. Going on to chapter four as our time is running out here, where do all the fights and quarrels among you come from? They come from your desires for pleasure, which are constantly fighting within you. You want things, but you cannot have them, so are you ready to kill? You strongly desire things, but you cannot get them, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have what you want because you do not ask God for it. Is that uh, in any way characteristic of our church today? Ye ask, and receive not, because ye ask amiss. Okay. What's that mean? You don't ask for the right things. That's right. This doesn't sound... I mean, if John the Baptist were to read this and follow this along, <clears throat> when those Pharisees showed up, he wouldn't be calling them snakes. You don't think so? <laughs> well, I mean, this doesn't this say you're supposed to be kind of nice and polite and... Honest. Well, what, what did Jesus say to those same scribes and Pharisees a few years later? Well, but that's the question. You are of your father, the devil. <laughs> that, but that's the question. You're, I, mean, it sounds, I mean, it sounds when you read this, if I were to hear a sermon on this, I don't think... You've that, heard plenty of sermons on this. Well, I know. And <laughs> then when I read about Jesus and the snakes, <laughs> you know, what, what, what is it? How do I interpret this for that kind of... But John the Baptist and Jesus in here and the snakes, and I don't see him saying it's well, okay, except for the snakes. If you, he goes on to say, if you want to be the world's friend, make yourself God's enemy. Don't think that there is no truth in the scripture that says the spirit that God placed in us is filled with fierce desires. But the grace that God gives is even stronger. As the scripture says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So then, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will run away from you. Shouldn't, that, shouldn't we do that? Doesn't that make sense? Resist the devil. Do you find the devil running away from you? It, probably because we haven't really got in the first part of that, Fred. Submit okay. yourselves, therefore, to God. Yeah. That's first. Mm -hmm. Then resist the devil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And I, I, I don't think we realize how the devil has to run. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think you can take that literally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then submit yourself to God and so forth. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you hypocrites. I wonder if he was speaking to any of the Pharisees in the church. Be sorrowful, cry and weep. Change your laughter into crying, your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Do not criticize one another, my friends. If you criticize or judge another Christian, you criticize and judge the law. If you judge the law, then you are no longer one who obeys the law, but one who judges it. God is the only lawgiver and judge. He alone can save and destroy. Who do you think you are to judge someone else? A little that, easy on the snake talk? <laughs> sounds like he's still talking to snakes, isn't he? Well, what do we make of James 4? Verse 17, drop down a few verses. So then if you do not do the good, if, so then if we do not do the good we know we should do, we are guilty of sin. How often do we, do we quote that definition of sin? But, but it doesn't make any difference which definition you use. They're all tied up in rebellion. Okay. <clears throat> How would you say this is tied up in rebellion? If you know something that you do, that you should do, and you rebel against it and don't do it, it's rebellion. Okay. Is that like not doing the dishes? <laughs> <laughs> if you know you should do them, yes. Pay your money, take your choice. It's deeper than that. I think it's deeper? Well. But it, it, it could be at, dish, at the dish level for somebody. Hmm. Could be for me. <laughs> but <laughs> we had this conversation I before. I don't even go there. <laughs> well, my, my experience is if you don't do the dishes and she thinks you should, you're going to run into a real devil. <laughs> <laughs> the devil's not fleeing? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, there are two other definitions of, of sin in the Bible and we should, in the New Testament. We should, we should talk about briefly. The one we quote almost all the time was found in 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the transgression of the law, according to the, the King James Version, which it really is only three words. Sin is lawlessness or rebelliousness. Okay? So but there's a, rebellion in that one. Yeah. 
And there's another one, and that's found in, 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 in Romans. Romans 14, verse 23. Let me just uh, quote that, and I'll make sure I don't misquote it, but I'll, I'll turn over there. Romans 14, 23. But if they have doubts about what they eat, it's been talking about eat, eating food offered to idols. But if they have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them when they eat it because their action is not based on faith and anything that is not based on faith is sin. Now, how do those three fit together? Well, I think rebellion ties them together. <laughs> okay? Sin. Sin is sin is what you're saying, huh? No, I'm saying that sin is the rebellion. It can be exercised by doing something you know you shouldn't do, which is equal to breaking a law. If you believe in the law, you break it. You're doing something you know you shouldn't do. And whatsoever is not of faith? Well, if you're in a faith relationship, or should be, and you break that faith and rebel against it, it's the same song, second mm -hmm. verse. Okay. So, here in James, we have seen... Uh, so far that he's dealing with probably a bunch of fairly difficult church members and he's trying to get them to, to, to live together in peace and harmony. So look at chapter 5. And now you rich people, listen to me. Weep and wail over the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted away and your clothes have been eaten by moths. Your gold and silver are covered with rust and this rust will be a witness against you and will eat up your f flesh like fire. Doesn't sound like a little bit envious. I mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's wrong with being rich? I don't. Some... You have piled up riches in these last days. You have not paid any wages to those who work in your fields. That's what's wrong oh. with it. Listen to their complaints. The cries of those who gather in your crops have reached the ears of God, the Lord Almighty. Your life here on earth has been full of luxury and pleasure. You have made yourselves far fat for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent people, and they do not resist you. It's pretty, pretty serious talk, right? Be patient then, my friends, until the Lord comes. See how patient farmers are as they wait for their crop to produce their land to produce precious crops. They wait patiently for the autumn and spring rains. You also must be patient. Keep your hopes high, for the day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord's coming is near. Do not complain against one another, my friends, so that God will not judge you. The judge is near, ready to appear. My friends, remember the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Take them as examples of patient endurance under suffering. Any idea which prophets he might have been thinking about? Jesus said, which prophet didn't your fathers kill, right? Hmm. You have heard of Job's patience, and you know how the Lord provided for him in the end. For the Lord is full of mercy and compassion. Above all, my friends, do not use an oath when you make a promise. Do not swear by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Say only yes when you mean yes and no when you mean no. And then you, have not, you will not come under God's judgment. What is that talking about? Oh, is there something going on? With do we ever hear people saying more than yes or no? Mm, a lot of four-letter words in front of it or behind it. <laughs> a lot of four-letter words, wow. Okay. And what does this verse, what this basically says is, keep your language clean, mean what you say, and say what you mean, and don't, don't just speak a lot of nonsense, right? It seems like a lot of people's swearing is a type of a curse. Mm -hmm. I swear I'm going to get you. I swear you're going to have something bad happen to you. Don't do it, mm -hmm. is what he's saying. Don't, yeah. don't have that type of language. Well, are any of you in trouble? They should pray. Are any of you happy? They should sing praises. Are any of you sick? They should send for the church elders who will pray for them and rub olive oil on them in the name of the Lord. This prayer made in faith will heal the sick. The Lord will restore them to health, and the sins they have committed will be forgiven. Um, have you, any of you had the experience of anointing someone who is sick? And watch them rise up out of their beds and <coughs> be healthy again? Praying, praying for them, maybe not with the oil, 
If you wait long enough, sometimes it happens. <laughs> I, I don't know about anointing, but my mom would put any smelly thing on you, and she'll give you tea and give you other medicine also, but she will pray and, oh, you'll smell terrible, but you'll, you'll get well just to make a stop. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Well, you know that the Roman Catholic Church has turned this into a sacrament. These verses have been a basis on which they have established the, what they call the, the last rites, the, the unction. And um, you think that's what this is supposed to be? Something you do for the, for the people who are dying? This says it's spo they're supposed to get well. Well, we have, we have a ritual in our church mm -hmm. that we do this. Uh, <clears throat> and... Uh, Sometimes it's not long before they die. Mm -hmm. we, we do this when they're, we think they're, they might be near death many times. Yeah. Is this extreme unction? Well, <laughs> I don't want to create problems for the church here. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I mean, this strongly seems to imply you do this and they're going to get well. And... Um, well, it goes on. There are times when that doesn't happen. We're, we're, we've got just a little bit of time left. Look, up, look it on. So then confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you will be healed. Oh, this says faults, not sins. Okay. The prayer of a good person has a powerful effect. True. Yes. But is this confess to the person that you did or that you wronged, mm -hmm. not to uh, lay yourself open to a bunch of other people and then uh, they use that against you? Yes, you do have to be careful that others yeah. aren't using something uh, you've said against it, you. I think if you if you use that as sins, then you have just made a text that says you can go to the priest and confess, and I don't think that's what we're supposed to be doing. Well, it uh, talks about Elijah's prayer of faith, and we know what happened. But then I want to read the last couple of verses. My friends, if any of you wander away from the truth and, and another one brings you back again, remember this, whoever turns a sinner back from the wrong way will save that sinner's soul from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. We all should look at the book of James. We should see a record of a lot of nonsense that we should stay away from, and we should practice the faith of Abraham and Rahab. We'll see you next week.